Tonight's topic is understanding lymphomas and multiple myeloma. Made easy. Tonight we are fortunate and delighted to bring to you Dr. Peter Anglin, Director of Oncology Program, Stronach Regional Cancer Center at Southwark. Dr. Anglin obtained his medical degree in 1986 from Queen's University of Kingston, Ontario, and between 1986 and 87, he completed his internship at the Ottawa Civic Hospital. Dr. Anglin subsequently earned clinical fellowships in Internal Medicine, University of Ottawa, 89 to 92, Immunology, University of Toronto, 92 to 94, and Oncology, Princess Margaret Hospital, 94 to 95. He has, over the past 15 years, been involved in clinical practice in the Greater Toronto Area as staff immunologist, oncologist with the Rouge Valley Health System, 95 to 2001. Staff physician at Princess Margaret Hospital, 99 to 2000, and staff hematologist at the Credit Valley Hospital, 2001 to 2007. Currently, he is staff hematologist at Princess Margaret Hospital. He actively participates in several committees dealing with cancer care and clinical trials. He also holds an MBA from the Rotman School of Management, University of Toronto. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Amy. Thank you. <laughs> very kind. Um, thank, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I, I'd like to thank and, and congratulate the organizing committee for this. It's, uh, it's nice to have a crowded and enthusiastic room. Uh, and I'd like to also particularly thank the Myeloma and uh, Lymphoma Societies for providing support and uh, awareness to get, uh, get the numbers out. So, and thank you for coming. Um, I, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes and lymphoma and myeloma is far too much to discuss in a, in a single session. So my goals of today really are to stay high level, talk a little bit about high level things around lymphomas of which there's about 30 different types and uh, a little bit about Hodgkin's lymphoma and, uh, and then myeloma. And I just want to focus on concepts really to get the points home that um, quality care close to home is really becoming a reality. That's the mantra for Cancer Care Ontario. And have, attending a number of international and, and national meetings in, in the various roles that I hold, I can say confidently that the uh, therapy that we're able to deliver here and in collaboration with some of our colleagues in the city are really second to none and we can be quite proud of that. So I'm going to take you through some of these uh, diseases a little bit at high level and show you how far we've come, where we're going and where we, where, where we hope to get. Um, for those of you coming at the back, is there, are, there's some chairs at the front. If you want to, I know no one likes to come up to the front, but there are some chairs up at the front. Please feel free to, to walk in and find a seat if you can. Uh, and meanwhile, I'll start. Um, so my plan is, I, there's no, you know, they made this room, there's not a clock that's evident, so I, I won't take phone calls. But I will have my phone here, so I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes. And that gives us a little bit of the time at the end, because the Myeloma Society and Lymphoma Society will, will just have a few words for you. And then uh, there's always, in my experience, a fair number of questions at things like this, and I'd be happy to, to entertain questions as well. So with no further ado, um, this is lymphoma. You see the limb? Anyhow, you have to see it says lymphoma like a limb, L-I-M-B. And anyhow, I know it's not that funny, but there's, <laughs> there's not a lot of funny lymphoma cartoons, to be honest. So that's, that's the start. So we'll talk a little bit about the lymphomas. What's interesting about this disease is there's no question it's increasing. You'll see time from 1980 to 2000 along the x-axis and incident cases in North America. And there's no question this disease is increasing in frequency. And no one's quite clear why. We we know we're not dying as much from heart attacks and things like that, which is good. But in terms of relative to other cancers, there seems to be more lymphoma around. So people like me are getting busier and busier. In Canada as a whole, we see about 6,000 cases a year. There are many, many different types of lymphomas. These are the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, and the pie graph shows you most of them. But there's two or three types that dominate. One's this thing called diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, or DLBC, that's this one. And then follicular lymphoma, which was one of the slower growing lymphomas. And then there's a whole raft of other types of lymphomas. Some of them more aggressive or fast growing, and some of them more indolent. But <clears throat> when we see people with swollen lymph nodes that get a biopsy, 
I don't know if there's probably some people in this room that have been in the clinic with me and sat in a room as I've explained a few things or tried to. But the first thing I say is we've got to be clear about the pathology. It's critical because that dictates a lot of what I'm going to tell you and how I'm going to manage you the next 5 and 10 and 15 years. So, so there's many types of lymphoma. Um, we have excellent, uh, diff different centers do different things at, at uh, what we do at the Stronach Cancer Center is we send all of our lymphoma cases down to the hematopathologist at Sunnybrook for a secondary pathology review so we can ver be very clear and confident what the tissue diagnosis is. Um, Hodgkin's disease is not, or Hodgkin's lymphoma makes up about a fifth of all the lymphomas. So that's something called a Reed Sternberg cell, which is one of the pathological features of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, lymphomas can present with many different manifestations. You can feel perfectly well or you can be really sick and they can evolve over weeks or months or years. Um, so there's a whole, whole array of how they might present. There are certain characteristic things like weight loss and night sweats that are more associated with lymphomas than some of the other tumors that can cure us. And something else that's interesting, some people with lymphomas get pruritus or itchiness. You don't see that with other solid tumors like lung cancer or breast cancer. But um, almost any tissue can be involved with lymphoma. Most commonly it's lymph nodes, but sometimes they're inside us and we can't feel them. But uh, these, any tissue can be infiltrated. Often you see the bone marrow taken over, so when people are being investigated for lymphomas, we'll often do a bone marrow sample from their back of their pelvis to see if there's involvement there. Sometimes the central nervous system can be involved and that's a challenge. Sometimes the blood can be affected and you can get low platelets or the, the red cells break up and sometimes blood, the bone can be affected and you can get fractures and spinal cord compression and sometimes it infiltrates around the heart or around the lungs. So really what, what I find interesting about the lymphomas is the heterogeneity of the presentations uh, both by various tissue types that I showed you but also it presents in so many <coughs> different clinical ways. And so our job is to figure that out, be very clear what you've got and then to give you the best therapy possible. CAT scans, some of you may have had these before. This is the back and this is the front. This is your backbone and these are a bunch of lymph nodes in someone's abdomen that should not be there. And that's a CAT scan of a chest. So we, we, have, uh, we need CAT scans a lot to stage a lymphoma, see how, what the anatomic extent is. When we, one of the most important things we do, as I show, is we, we do a biopsy. So we biopsy an enlarged lymph node. Sometimes we have to use a CT scanner to go in and take a little piece of tissue out from inside. But the key is to stain it up, look under the microscope, and start <coughs> deciding what kind of lymphoma this is. We have some tricks. One of the things that we do is we stain them for different things, something called CD20. This is something that tells me this is a B-cell lymphoma. And then BCL2, this is a, a protein that tells me what kind of lymphoma it may be. So we do some special stains on these cells to help us classify the lymphoma. Um, so at the end of the day, when, when we're investigating someone with lymphoma, we do a number of investigations. The biopsy is the most important. We do some laboratory tests to see how the organs are working. And then we want to stage someone anatomically. What's the extent of the lymphoma? So we do CAT scans. We do something else called a whole body gallium scan. This is where you get injected with something called gallium. And this, it, it's a radioisotope. It's a safe radioisotope. And it goes to uh, organs or tissues that are involved with the lymphoma. In this case, it's the heart and the lymph nodes under the left, uh, on the, under the left arm there. Um, so this idea of staging, people are always fixated on stage, I find. Um, you know, at what stage am I? And it is important. And in lymphoma, if you've got a single area involved, I'm sorry this doesn't, should we turn these lights off, by the way? I just was realizing that uh, a lot, I'm going to show lots of pictures today because that makes things interesting. Um, but let's, if we could, if you just, I don't think people will fall asleep. But uh, is it the lower one? Uh, yeah. There. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, because, <laughs> gee, there's a body here. Because <laughs> I noticed the contrast. So, uh, yeah, and that, that'll help. Because, I, I mean, one of, I've got 40 or 50 slides. I'm going to show a lot of pictures to try to keep it interesting. So stage one is a single lymph node. Stage two is a couple of lymph node areas above the diaphragm. When we say stage three, it's above and below the diaphragm. And then stage four, which is very common, it's either involvement of the liver or the bone marrow or actually the lungs, which they didn't do there. So that's how we anatomically 
stage lymphoma. So there's the tissue biopsy to see what exactly is this lymphoma, what kind. Then there's the anatomic staging. And you put those two things together and then we had, can formulate the appropriate management for you. Um, one of the, now, <clears throat> there's many types of lymphomas, as I mentioned, but we generally break them down into sort of they're indolent or slow growing, they're more rapid growing, and then they're very, very fast growing. And these slow growing lymphomas, they go on for many years and you don't often have to treat them right away, but the bottom line is you generally can't cure them. People can live with this for 10, 15, 20 plus years sometimes. The more aggressive lymphomas, you know, have a, if you don't treat them, you know, they progress or you get into problems a lot sooner. They can be curable, but you've got to treat them at diagnosis. And then Hodgkin's lymphoma, all types, we tend to treat if we diagnose it. And I'm going to get in a little bit into the high levels of, of how we treat these things, which is generally some chemotherapy, some antibody therapy, or radiotherapy. Um, one of the things that we try to do when you have, so I might say you've got diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and it's stage 2, one of the other things that I'll do is then say, well, how are you going to do? What's your prognosis? Which is the most relevant question a lot of patients and their families have when we finally work out their diagnosis and their stage. And we have different tricks for that. We have a little schema called the International Prognosis. No, what's the IPI? I don't even remember. The International Prognostic something. <laughs> and then I have something else called the Flippy for low-grade lymphoma. And then there's one for Hodgkin's disease. So there are many different schema and things that I can do to say you've got stage 2 diffuse large B cell lymphoma and your IPI score is 2, therefore statistically this is how you're going to do if we treat you like this. So we can get very, very specific. But the one thing I tell people for any cancer, these are the statistics and then there's you. Because sometimes the statistics don't look so encouraging for some people. But I always tell people these are statistics and people always don't follow the textbooks or statistics either. So I practiced long enough to know that. I've also practiced long enough to know that the statistics are the statistics and there's something to be said for them and you don't completely ignore them. So anyhow, that's kind of what we do to work work up patients for lymphoma. So hopefully for either family or some patients in the room, some of this resonance resonates with the experience and the communications you've had. So here's an example for indolence. Say someone had a low-grade follicular lymphoma that was a stage 4. Well, there's a special score looking at age and what your hemoglobin is and if your bone marrow is involved and the size of the lymph nodes and something called the beta-2 microglobulin, which is a blood test. And you kind of measure those and then you can see, well, how am I going to do long term? And so I'll just take you over to this curve, but look, this is overall survival 100% times zero. And here's out to five years. And depending, a lot of these people are sort of 98, 95% survival out to, to five years. So, I mean, some of these people can do very well long term. Now, not everyone does that. This curve doesn't do quite as well. Still pretty good. But some people end up not uh, getting to five years. This is a progression-free survival. When we say progression-free, that means you're free of cancer. So you'll notice that's not quite as good. So out at five years, maybe 85% of people on this curve are alive and free of their are alive and free of their lymphoma. But gee, down here, well, about 40%, only about 40% of the people are free of their lymphoma at five years. So these are the kind of tools that we use when we talk about lymphomas and intervention, how people do they stay free of their disease for a long period of time and do they live a long time. Those are the two important parameters that people are interested in. Certainly we as clinicians are interested as well. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of details of the treatment of lymphomas because there's 30 different types, but there's certainly some very um, there's some commonality and some standard approaches. There's acronyms for the different things that we use, but generally we treat lymphomas with either nothing, we'll watch and wait, because some lymphomas don't need treatment for many years and it doesn't affect long-term outcome and people can be free and well for many years and not require it. But a lot of lymphomas require treatment and we use different drugs. We often combine chemotherapy with a special antibody called rituxan and that's the R part of these protocols. But the best acronym I think in the world for, for some chemotherapy, come on in, yeah, come on in. <laughs> I, you the wrong place. That's okay. Sorry, no problem. Find some seats if you can. There's some seats over on this side too, uh, if you can all. Or there's some seats down here on the on the far end. Good. Okay. 
But one of the acronyms for the chemotherapy is CHOP, and isn't that a great acronym? Which uh, that's a short form for four drugs, including prednisone, that we use. And this is this has been a mainstay of treating lymphomas for about 30 years. And in fact, it's been tested against many, many different regimens, and many it still has not been usurped. So. Uh, here's one thing that I tell people is not a, all the new drugs aren't necessarily the best. And there's some st old standbys that we still revert to and still remain the standard of care. It's the same thing for Hodgkin's lymphoma. ABVD is the standard regimen we use when we give chemotherapy for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, it, it's the standard. We haven't found anything better yet. Now, there's been lots of work and trials published, but nothing to the point that's usurped ABVD as the treatment. Um, so these are some examples of chemotherapeutic regimens that we use for lymphoma. Uh, all of these are kind of the standard approaches we use here. And these are the treatments we use as what's called a first line therapy in people that we're treating for lymphoma. Um, then there's second line, third line, and fourth line if people tend to relapse. And I'm not going to sort of get into that as much. Radiation therapy is utilized for lymphoma. In particular, if there's a an area causing uh, or pushing on a critical organ, we'll use some uh, radiation sometimes. Uh, spinal cord compression, we'll use it. And occasionally when lymphoma is only in a one single area and it's limited, then we'll give radiation with or without some chemotherapy to try to get rid of all of the disease. So at this center, for example, we have a couple of the radiation oncologists who are interested in lymphomas as well. So we would collaborate on them after we fully stage someone and have the tissue type clarified. Then we sit with the radiation oncologist and say, or have them see them in consultation. Then we decide what's the best treatment in this, for this patient, radiation alone, chemotherapy alone, or a combination of the two. And that's called combined modality therapy. We do that quite frequently for different types of lymphoma. So that's kind of what we do here. Um, you know, there's something about treating patients. If for low-grade lymphoma, it used to be that when patients were asymptomatic, had no symptoms, that we would not do anything, and you could be well for on average two or three years, and then usually you'd need some sort of treatment. That did not compromise patient outcome. Patients still lived as long. Um, and they responded to chemotherapy when you, when you wanted to give it. Well, someone went and did a study saying, what happens if we gave low-grade lymphoma patients a little bit of what's called rituxan? It's just an antibody therapy. You don't lose your hair. You take it weekly for four weeks. And this was presented as a, at a, one of our big meetings one or two years ago. And the long and the short is the group that the, the group that didn't get any treatment here, well, guess what? In, the, in about a, two or three years, they needed some sort of chemotherapy. The group that just got a bit of the rituxan at time zero, a lot of them did very well and really didn't need any more therapy for a long time. So again, we're always looking at, at revising how we approach certain lymphomas, and this has created quite a stir. And I guess this has probably lowered my threshold a little bit to treat low-grade lymphoma in some patients. But Again, we're always trying to look at new ways to better the patient outcome. This is an example of how we've improved the uh, treatment for what's called large cell lymphoma. It's one of the aggressive lymphomas. And BC has one of the best cancer registries in the world. And they're always reporting off it. And so they were looking at how they treated large cell lymphoma before we started giving rituxan. So this is a survival curve. 100% of people are alive at time zero. And as time moves along here, by the time you get out to four and five years, the number of patients alive with this type of lymphoma was around 50%. So, you know, this is a pretty significant disease for people to have. You cure a lot, but there's also a challenge with people you don't cure. Now, we introduced this drug called rituxan. We've been using this probably about eight or ten years in practice. And what's happened to the survival curves in the post-rituxan era? Well, look at survival has improved. To my, eye, my eyeball, that's about 20%. So that's an example of a single drug impacting outcome and, uh, and quickly becomes a mainstay of patient therapy. So that's one of the most dramatic examples I can show you of how treatments evolve. So we maintain the CHOP. Remember that CHOP backbone that's been around for 30 years because nothing's better? Gee, but we added this new drug to it and it just got a whole lot better. That theme, I think, carries through a lot of lymphomas, myeloma, and clinical research going forward, where we have pretty good old drugs, and we add some new drugs to them that work in a different way, in a complementary or synergistic way, and you get a much better patient outcome. I think we can all be proud of that kind of progress. <coughs> um, that's just a redundant curve.
I often get asked a lot about PET scans because everyone wants a PET scan. It must be the best thing to get. So here's an example of PET scan and this says a PET scan confirms the squeaking in Bob's head is his lost hamster. <laughs> so there's Bob, Bob in the PET scan, I guess that's what they, but I guess we'll get a little pet and hamster. Um, <coughs> but this is an important, and I don't mean to be flippant about the modality, it's an important modality, it's helpful. And what it allows us to do is sometimes after we treat lymphoma, we'll have a residual mass. Yeah, I hope you may not see that so well, but this lump shouldn't be there. <coughs> but when we have big lumps in lymphoma, they shrink down to smaller lumps, but they often don't go away. And so at the end of th treatment, say you've had six or eight rounds of treatment, we'll have this residual lump and we'll try to think, is that viable tumor or not? Because if it's not, we don't want to give you unnecessary treatment. If it is, we may need to give you some more treatment. So what the PET scan does, it, it, it looks to see if the, the uh, tumor is metabolizing a special type of sugar. And if the, the viable tumor tends to glow in the dark. So you see, I, I didn't bring the multi-level PET. I could, there's some with very uh, many different types of color. But anyhow, this is glowing and it's glowing over here. So that would be suggestive of potential viable tumor that's still there that may say, hey, you know, we should consider some radiation here or we should consider a biopsy. So that's an example of what PET scans do. Often we don't need PET scans and it depends on your type of lymphoma and your particular circumstances. We do have access to PET scanning here. We send uh, all our patients to, uh, we have been sending them to PMH and Sunnybrook, but more recently we just use Sunnybrook because geographically it's closer. And we usually have access to their machines by 10 to 14 days. So we've been quite pleased with that. And we do use PET scanning when warranted. Um, this is one study where they looked at the prognostic significance of doing a PET scan after you're, you're midway through your chemotherapy for um, one of the more aggressive lymphomas. So you had two cycles of chemotherapy and you had another PET scan. And people that, this is, remember 100%, this is a, is this a survival curve? This is a progression free curve. So 100% of people aren't progressing. And if you got a couple cycles of chemotherapy and your PET scan went negative, meaning it didn't glow, look at you, you the progression free survival was very, very good. That means the tumors were dying quickly and it was much less likely that the tumor was going to come back. What they also found is if PET scan was positive, you had a very high chance of the tumor progressing again and you needing additional therapy to try to cure your lymphoma. This is quite a dramatic curve. In reality, it's not that simple. This was a 2000, you'll note the date of this publication was 2002. An awful lot of work now is going into PET scanning, how we should appropriately use it, when a PET scan should dictate change in therapy. So this is a big work in progress, topic of a lot of clinical trials. And I guess what I'm getting at again is we're using PET scans now appropriately but not for everyone with every lymphoma because often you do a PET scan and you don't know what the results mean. But I'm confident going forward we'll probably be incorporating it more and more into our decision making. I spent a little bit of time like that because I, I end up talking to a lot of patients about PET scans. So I think it's important, it's certainly relevant. Um, something else we talk about is transplant, like bone marrow transplants and things like that. We do utilize bone marrow transplants for lymphoma and multiple myeloma, uh, both as standard treatment or for relapse disease. Uh, now patients in this area, if you require those kind of modalities, we have a very good and strong working relationship with Princess Margaret Hospital and we co collaborate with them and uh, things happen what I think is relatively seamlessly. There's always that geographic transplant or geographic issue to deal with. A lot of people ask me, well, what, what's a transplant? And all a, a tran an autologous transplant is, it's a trick to give more chemotherapy. And if you give more chemotherapy, you can kill more cancer cells. So just to show you what an auto transplant is, basically stem cells are collected usually from a peripheral vein. Usually we put a special catheter in and we, we suck out your blood and then can isolate the stem cells, which actually float around your blood. And then we put them in a little test tube and we save them. And that's your bone marrow cells because they actually circulate in your blood too. When I first started training, we had to put patients to sleep and tap their bone marrows. Um, that was, you know, uh, this is a lot easier. We collect it through peripheral blood and those stem cells work better. And then once we've stored the stem cells safely in a fridge and put them in funny chemicals, then what we do is give chemotherapy to you at such high doses as that we obliterate the bone marrow. So most chemo that we give, the first dose limiting toxicity is you get irreversible suppression of the bone marrow. 
So to get around that, if you take the bone marrow and hold it over here and then give the whacking doses of chemo, you can escalate doses tenfold and kill more tumor cells. That's it. It's a trick to give more chemo. And then after you give the, uh, after you give the chemotherapy, you have to remember to give back the stem cells again because you've got a problem if you don't. And then that happens a couple of days <coughs> after the chemotherapy and that's usually considered day zero of an autologous bone marrow transplant. So an auto transplant is generally getting your own bone marrow cells back. That's the, by far the most common transplant that's dealt with both in lymphoma and multiple myeloma. And it's a trick just to give more chemotherapy. That's it. But it works, you know, and it allows us to cure more patients in certain circumstances. And again, we have a nice working relationship with PMH, which is one of the, you know, I don't know if it's the, I think it's the busiest in the country and certainly one of the largest transplant centers in the world. So we're quite confident and appreciate their abilities. So where is lymphoma management going? Um, we're, genetic, we're looking at the genetics of tumors better, we're looking at better imaging, and we're looking at better drug combinations. I showed you one exam, example of adding rituxan to CHOP, right, and how much better. Now that's probably the most impressive example I wanted to show you, but more of that is definitely possible as we go forward. And this is the way, just to give you an idea, we're starting to do fancy things where we look at many genes of tumors to get more specific in the uh, treatment of them. This stuff is not ready for prime time. There's hypothesis about changing treatments depending on the genetics of the tumor. Not ready for prime time. A lot of research is going into this to give more specific treatment to individuals. The other thing that we're doing for drugs, this is just illustrates on the surface of a cell, there's many different molecules involved in a pathway that stimulate cells to grow. And so there's all kinds of drugs going on to inhibit these different proteins. Uh, unbelievable what's happening is these pathways are understand. So you get a molecule that comes in and blocks this, and all of a sudden a tumor start, stops growing. So this is the kind of work that's going on that's far beyond my comprehension, comprehension, but I can list a whole, like here's in the lymphomas, here's just one laundry list of a bunch of new drugs that are being developed. Some of them are just starting to be available. This group of antibodies is just starting to be available. Bendamustine is just coming into Canada now. We can get this, for example, compassionate access. And I think we were giving it to someone last week. So as these drugs come before they're approved by Health Canada, we do have ways to potentially access these drugs. It's very individual, very disease specific, and very drug specific. But uh, again, there's many drugs coming up the pipeline for lymphoma. Uh, here's one example, just, just one example, a drug called SGN35. Um, I can't, it, it's got another generic name I'm not going to tell you because it's somewhat impronounceable by me right now. Um, but it, it's, a, it's an antibody that attaches to certain lymphomas and it's sort of used in some non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's lymphomas. And the message here is this drug in patients who've had a lot of treatment, tumors get tougher and more stubborn as we give them chemo. And when people have two or three or four cycles of chemotherapy, tumors become smarter and learn how to deal with chemotherapy and they progressively become more resistant to treatment. And that's what a lot of the focus in oncology is, is why do cells become resistant, how do we overcome that and kill the cells for good. But in the, with this drug, we see three out of four patients have shrinkage, substantive shrinkage of tumor by giving them this drug. This is just, this drug is, will, will, will come into prime time very quickly. It's still early days. I would mention to, excuse me, all drugs are better at first than they are in the real world. Okay, I mean, but that said, this is very exciting. And again, this is a drug that I would anticipate in the next uh, two to three to four years starting to use for some of the challenging patients uh, with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And what happens when they prove activity here, then we start using them early. So there are trials going on now using this drug with the ABVD, that first line chemo we use for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Well, there's trials now adding this to that to improve outcomes in, in Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we often find out if they work and then we move them up, say maybe more people should get this to improve the cure rates. That's kind of how things evolve. So this is the split between myeloma and lymphoma. Stuff, is this, oops, this says stuff to do when you have cancer, use a Nerf ball to see if your oncologist has a sense of humor. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyhow, uh, the things you find on the internet, eh? <clears throat> so that, that's my rocket review of lymphoma, you know. I hope it made a little bit of sense. I covered a lot, but I wanted to keep it broad.
and I guess to highlight where we're going and also this is a lot of the kind of stuff you see here are things that we do here at the Stronach Cancer Center. I'm going to talk a little bit about multiple myelomas now. <laughs> And now this is a cancer of the bone marrow, um, so inside the bones. And the bone marrow is kind of inside our pelvis, inside our sternum, and inside the long bones of our body. That's kind of where, that's the factory for the blood. And it's a proliferation of these things called plasma cells. Um, it's about actually 2,000 Canadians a year that have this disease. And the median age of multiple myeloma is about 65. Okay, the median age of lymphoma is, is about 60, a little lower. And this is, what happens with myeloma is you get the proliferation of these cells in the bone marrow and it can cause a low hemoglobin, which we call anemia. It can cause holes in the bone, which can be painful and cause fractures. It can cause the calcium to be high and it can cause the kidneys not to work so well. We call that renal insufficiency. And you also get other issues if the protein gets too high, the blood gets too thick, and a, and a few other things. So the problem then with myeloma is as it proliferates, it can cause a number of problems that make people come to their doctor and get diagnosed. This is an example of an MRI which helps us with imaging. Uh, this, is a, this is looking at the body cut in half. All right, It's called a sagittal view. It's like chopping someone in half. And this is the spine. And I guess, you know, not, not all of those vertebral bodies look the same. And those are what myelomatous involvement of the vertebral spine looks like with multiple myeloma. And those are th there's a number of things that we can do to help that, including radiotherapy. There are technical procedures now called vertebroplasty, where um, the orthopedic docs and the radiologists stick things in there and blow, blow them up again and put in cement and take away pain. So there's all kinds of interesting interventions we have to make people feel better with that. Um, the characteristic thing about myeloma is it tends to secrete an antibody into the blood. We use the term M protein or monoclonal protein. We can measure that and that often gives us just by a blood test a pretty good idea of how the myeloma is progressing. If the M protein is going up, the disease is progressing and if it's coming down, we're making some headway. If we are treating myeloma though, we usually know we're making headway because the hemoglobin improves, people feel better and they have less pain and their calcium gets better. There's a bunch of things that we can check. Um, this is something that we do on patients with myeloma called a protein electrophoresis where I measure the level of the protein to see if our interventions are, are helping in, in controlling the disease. So I, I guess you know, over, myeloma is a disease that, that carries over many years. When I first started practicing more than 15 years ago, uh, patients with multiple myeloma, I would sit down with Dr. Bergsegel, who's one of the pioneers of myeloma in the world, and he used to do the clinic down in PMH and write the chapters in the textbook. And uh, he was one of the first one to treat m multiple myeloma with a drug called melphalan back in the 60s. But anyhow, we'd sit down and we'd tell patients on average you're going to live three to three and a half years. Well, that's all changed, and I'll show you by the end that three and a half years is who knows now. We don't think that this so much as an incurable illness is a chronic illness, and that the length of life now for patients with myeloma is seven, eight, nine years now with a lot of the therapies we've had. So we've made tremendous uh, gains in managing this disease. One of the things we do, though, over time, this is the monoclonal protein, and so people kind of grumble along, and then it starts to go up, and then we know they're progressing and they're getting sick. We give them chemo, things settle down, but eventually it grows again and over time, eventually most patients become resistant to all our treatments with this and, that, and that's a problem and that can shorten people's lives. But generally this is playing out now over many years as opposed to a few years and that's a big headway that I've seen in the 15 years that I've practiced. We have a lot of uh, interesting tests that we do for myeloma and one of the things that we do on the bone marrow specimen is we look at the cytogenetics or the DNA of the, of the tumor to help predict how that patient will do. <clears throat> we call it FISH, or cytogenetic studies, and that gives us some very good prognostic information of how someone with myeloma will do. Now what we do at Stronic is we send patients out, we do the, the studies in the morning, and we send them out to North York General Lab, which is one of the best labs in the province, and they do our FISH studies for us. So most of us have access to these kind of things. And so just like just like um, lymphoma, when I see someone who's got abnormal blood counts and a protein in the blood, it's fairly simple to diagnose with you, you do a bone marrow and a couple of things, and then I can walk and say, you have multiple myeloma. And what does that mean for you? Well, the next thing is, well, is yours good myeloma or bad myeloma? Because myeloma, despite a single name, 
can be very heterogeneous. Some people have more aggressive disease and are tougher to treat. Other people have much more responsive disease and do well for a longer period of time. So we again try to risk stratify looking at various elements in the cytogenetics and some other things in their blood to get an idea of how someone's going to do. And this is where, you know, one, one, this is just an example of one sort of schema that we use to, to classify patients. But the long and the short is depending on your prognostic group, this group used to live three years and the good group lived out to sort of six or seven years. So, you, you know, it's quite a range. I want to tell you something. This survival curve is drawn from data um, 2007 years ago published and so was using older treatments that we use now and I can guarantee you whatever your group that you're in now this has moved out and people are doing better than what you see here. All of these are older survival curves but I do have to show you something to illustrate what we're achieving. So when we give, I guess this is stating the obvious, but anytime we treat cancer the goal is to take all of these and make it as small as possible, right? By killing the tumor with the various uh, drugs that we have in our armamentarium. And here's probably a different way to put it. That well, I keep wanting to take this pen off or point something, but you can see, you can all see this okay? So at diagnosis, you know, this says you have about a trillion cells or something of myeloma here. And then as we start giving you chemo, we take that trillion cells and then we have certain definitions for a partial response and complete remission and that kind of thing. And that's by measuring the protein and checking the bone marrow and doing some other fancy tests. We know that even though we call you a complete remission by our most sensitive tests, we know that in most patients there's myeloma cells there looming that eventually, often years later, can kind of grumble back and we need to address the myeloma again. We know that. But what we're finding now with modern therapies is there are some people where we drive them down to this area where we know some cells are there, but people are, you know, eight and ten years later and their myeloma hasn't come back yet. So again, this concept that are we really curing some patients now or are we creating a chronic disease? We would have never talked like this when I trained 15 years ago. That's the kind of headway we're making. Um, there's all kinds of drugs that have changed. I, I meant to put a newer slide. I, you got the 2000, I've got a 2010 slide here. So there's been a tremendous number of new drugs uh, available for multiple myeloma over time. <coughs> um, but myeloma, just to tell you briefly how we treat it, when we diagnose myeloma, the first thing we do is say we're going to give you some form of induction therapy, which is usually some steroids and one or two other drugs. And you get that for four to six months. And then to, if you're generally 65 or less, we'll continue giving, we'll give you a high dose treatment and a transplant. Remember I told you, all the transplant is is a trick to give you high dose therapy to kill more cells. So people 65 or less after four to six months of treatment in the Toronto area, if you're reasonably fit, if you don't have a major medical problem, you'll get a bone marrow transplant. So you'll get high dose melphalan to kill more cells and then get your bone marrow back. And then after that, we've started giving people maintenance treatment where we put you on a pill and say, here, take this. This will keep the myeloma away for three or four years. We do that, or you know, we hope. At some point, usually, the myeloma will grumble back, and then we're into relapse disease and using some different drugs or sometimes the same drug to treat your myeloma again. So that's sort of the longitudinal way that we, we manage multiple myeloma. Um, I don't really, didn't want to really get into the specifics of the regimens we use. We use a very standard induction regimen that we coordinate with Princess Margaret Hospital. These are the gold standards in the world as well. And again, with the, the one, you know, Cancer Care Ontario has been very good to standardize treatments around cancer centers in the province. And so, you know, most places where you have hematologists comfortable with myeloma, you get a pretty consistent treatment in, in Ontario. <coughs> There are many, many new drugs have come out. I think five drugs in the last eight years have been approved by the FDA for myeloma. And that's, say, I use the FDA statistic because you hear that more at international talks, but that translates to Health Canada approval generally. Sometimes there's a year delay, which is another issue. But um, we've got all kinds, these are immunomodulatory agents. There's a bunch of new drugs here. And we use a lot of lenalidomide now. Pomalidomide's coming. These are, it's a drug called bortezomib. We use a lot of that now. Um, this one's the new one. Curfilzomab's coming. Here's some other things. So we have lots of drugs that we use. But I'm just going to um, show you what we do. Remember I showed you that slide? 
<coughs> where we, you know, you start, you start treating, you get a partial remission, near complete remission, complete remission. We still think that taking those thousand cells and making them one cell is probably the best thing because you can go into a remission and it may take several years before the myeloma comes back again. Well, that's reflected on when we give people chemotherapy, what's called induction, we can get a complete remission or near complete remission in about 32% of patients just with chemotherapy. This used to be the number after a transplant. But now we use better drugs for induction and we're getting the same transplant numbers. And then you add a transplant to that and all of a sudden you've got, you know, 55 or 60 percent of patients who are on almost a complete remission. And we know when you do that you prolong people's lives. So we've come a long way from the oral drugs of melphalan and prednisone where the complete remission rate was 5 percent to sort of 60 percent complete remission rates and people living longer. Um, I do want to sort of focus on <coughs> one concept today, and that is, you know, how we've just the way we, the new drugs that are being developed for myeloma, for lymphoma, and for cancer for that matter, are really different than the old world drugs that we used to use. Some of you who've studied some science understand the cell cycle when cells divide, where there's DNA synthesis and eventually mitosis and one cell divides into two, then two into four, and there's different there's different drugs here that it can interfere with the replication of DNA, which is critical for cell division. <coughs> and our whole host of old, old drugs worked in different parts of this cell cycle. Um, well, newer drugs are going way beyond that. So we talked about drugs that work at the tumor and the cell cycle where the tumors divide. But nowadays, drugs are focusing on, you know, cutting off the blood supply to tumors. We're looking at... <coughs> some of the immune cells around the tumor and killing them, shutting off the secretion of various substances that may support a tumor. So now we're focusing on drugs that work around the tumor in the so-called tumor milieu or bone marrow milieu. And that's, myeloma's been a leader in developing those drugs because it's kind of an easy drug, easy disease to study. It's in the bone marrow. You can sample it in three minutes and it's, it's, it's really come a long way. So again, the concept that we're not just looking now at killing tumors based on this cell cycle kinetics, but we're looking at the whole micro environment around tumors as we look at new drugs and how they might work. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this just is a simple slide to show you that new drugs are better. And we use, we use the term novel agents for myeloma, but we have access to these novel agents. They're not so novel anymore. More novel agents are coming. But this was a study done, I, I, yeah, there's been a lot like this, but two or three years ago where, you know, they looked at how patients did, and this is just based on did they get exposed to new drugs or not. And the patients that got the new drugs did a lot better. Now, there, there's a lot of problems with these kind of analysis because if you're too sick to get a drug, you're not going to get a new drug. And it may have been because you had bi bad disease to start with. But all of that said, these newer drugs unquestionably are affecting quality of life and length of life now. Um, here's a couple of agents that will probably, these are, carfilzomib uh, is available on clinical trials downtown. It'll probably be coming to light in the next year or two. And this is a better bortezomib. And this drug called pomalidomide, I don't know where they come up with these names. <laughs> um, this is the new lenalidomide. So again, they're taking old drugs and making them better. But they're not just doing that. Oh, I'm going to, they're not just doing that. I want to touch on one concept. What we've learned in myeloma is you get some chemotherapy up front and you may get a transplant. But one of the things that we're starting to do is give us something called consolidation or maintenance therapy where after the treatment's done, we'll put you on a pill or, or something else to try to suppress the disease longer. And trials have now evolved showing that that can make a big difference depending uh, on what drug you're taking. So often if people get a transplant for myeloma, we're putting them on a drug afterwards to, to uh, and that often keeps the myeloma away for, well, sometimes three or four years. Uh, and that's just the maintenance therapy showing. So this, this was just one example of a study where that showed maintenance therapy kept the tumor away for three and a half years versus someone who didn't get maintenance therapy for two years. This was a large clinical trial. So this is the kind of, when we do a randomized trial and half people get the intervention, half the don't, 
at the end of the day, this intervention looked like it helped people, and this changes practice. So these trials are just matured, you know, these were just presented in the spring of 2011, so last year. So, you know, myeloma practice in the last year has changed, and that now we're giving maintenance lenalidomide, or at least offering it to patients after an autologous stem cell transplant. One could say, well, why do you need the trial to show that? Well, there are many, many, many instances in clinical medicine where something seems like a good idea and you do a trial, you end up killing more people or causing more harm than good. So it's absolutely critical that you rigorously look at new interventions to make sure they're indeed better. Now, <clears throat> we don't transplant everyone. But remember I told you the median age of multiple myeloma is 65. So I see a lot of 80-year-olds with multiple myeloma. And um, just because you don't get a transplant doesn't mean you get inferior care. In fact, the newer drugs are getting so good in multiple myeloma that we actually wonder how much more does the transplant add. I want to be clear, it's still part of the main therapy and standard therapy in 2012. But, you know, 80-year-olds can have their myeloma controlled for four or five years you know, using different sequential drugs. One of the important things to bear in mind when you're giving treatment to everyone, and, and, and as people get elderly, you get a little more sensitive to the drugs, you have to be careful about quality of life. You have to know when to just stop the drugs. Sometimes you can have the myeloma doing great, but the patient feels crappy because of the drugs. And you have to know, you know what, let's just stop them. See how they do, look at other options. That's an important concept with myeloma is quality of life, because people are living many years. So you want to have good quality of life and live many years. This is my second last slide, I think. I think we're doing pretty well for time, good. Um, and this is, <coughs> this is um, you know, you're getting experts on the survival curves now, right? 100% of people alive, and as time goes on, we, there is some attrition. But this just shows you with different periods of time how people are living longer and longer, and that curve now should be out here. You know, so we're really making headway uh, in, in multiple myeloma. And, and that's just some hard evidence to show you that we are. So <clears throat> what new drugs are around for myeloma? Well, there's a ton, and I can't begin to pronounce half of them for you, but this is what we use. We do have um, the clinical trials group at Princess Margaret. I used to participate and then be a member of the myeloma group downtown. Um, we had, I think, at one point, 24 active myeloma studies going. Uh, in both first-line relapsed transplant setting. So there are many drugs coming down the pipeline. Um, not a lot of them have, now many drugs in a pipeline in a study, not as many get to prime time where they really make a difference. What we're doing though is the process to get drugs into clinical practice has improved substantively. This is, this, don't worry about the details of this slide. This just shows you, I told you about how tumors grow. There's surface receptors that stimulate DNA to divide, and there's all kinds of pathways that are being identified by smart scientists in the lab. We're able to now start identifying different proteins and, and, and produce drugs that are directed against those proteins. So on this slide alone, there's probably 12, 13, 14 drugs being developed for multiple myeloma alone. And you know some of those are going to be very effective. Some of those will be home runs. A lot won't. But now, you know, this is where science is going, you know, and understanding also the DNA and the genome. So it's exciting stuff as we, as we move ahead. Um, myeloma takeaways is that we've got many treatment options. We're still trying to figure out what order to give the drugs. And I think the one other thing I want to mention is the treatment priorities will, will always remain length of life and, and quality of life. And that holds for, for all diseases, especially for myeloma in a number of ways. Um, so that's lymphoma and myeloma in 40 minutes. You're experts. <laughs> I, I hope that was not too quick, but somewhat informative. Again, I, I really wanted to highlight for you that, that the uh, resources that we have available to treat your diseases now, we're fortunate we all have equal access to these drugs. And, and what we're doing really here is cutting edge and, and state of the art for 2012. And I think we can be proud of that. Um, I did want to introduce the, the myeloma and Myeloma Society and Lymphoma Society uh, reps. So maybe I'll take questions for five or ten minutes and then have them just talk for a couple of minutes at the end, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Are there any questions or you might all? Yes, thank you. Um, the question is a topical one, drug shortages. Uh, not just for cancer, by the way, but, a, a, but in other areas. Um, there are many, many issues coming up with drug shortages. Most of these drug shortages are affecting 
just sort of usual or standard drugs that we use for supportive care. Um, there's a couple of uh, companies in the United States that have had production issues. Uh, they're going through some changes. Um, the governments of both Canada and the United States now are trying to get some consistency about how these drugs are being delivered to us. In the vast majority of cases, they're not clinically important and we're able to do appropriate substitutes that do not affect clinical care. We have had a couple of occasions where we have had to make some substitutions on chemotherapy drugs uh, for a short period of time till the supply was restarted. But I can tell you being involved with clinical care here and sitting on Cancer Care Ontario um, uh, committees where these are discussed, we've been able to stay ahead of it. It does become an ongoing issue. Cancer Care Ontario is taking active steps to involve all of the cancer, cancer centers, the pharmacists, the Ministry of Health to, to minimize any treatment aberrations that may occur. Um, but it does remain an ongoing challenge. So my longer, my somewhat long-winded answer to you is clinical care at present is not being affected in a major way. We have had a little deeks along the way that we've had to adjust. And we may continue to do that. Again, a lot of these drugs aren't the sort of the big important, you know, the chopper toxins and ABVD I showed you. Sometimes it's a supportive care drug or an anti-nausea medication. But you know what? That's important too. We have to look for a different one to use sometimes in patients who require these kind of supportive drugs. Thank you. Yes. No, it's, it's an important and a good question. Cancer Care Ontario is very vigilant about how they fund drugs. I would tell you that 98% of the time we want to give chemotherapy, there's no impedance to us delivering the drugs. Um, in that particular case that you cite, there was an issue about funding using rituxan again in various lymphomas. They have provided us now a structure such that if you haven't had rituxan within a year, you've gone more than a year and your disease has been controlled more than a year, we're able to use it again. And there's some thought behind that because if your lymphoma is progressing four months after you've had rituxan, you know what? Rituxan is not working with this lymphoma. So that has been addressed. Sometimes <coughs> it takes a little longer than that we would like for drug indications to be approved. They're rigorously looked at at Cancer Care Ontario and there's systems in place now to expedite these reviews so we're starting to get these approvals faster. I've certainly seen that in the 10 or 15 years I've been practicing now. And so I guess what I would reassure this audience is that we really have very good drug access here. And I can, I'm, a, I'm a patient advocate by all means. We have very good drug access and there's very few occasions that I can't use a drug. And if we can't use a drug and we really want to use it, we do have some avenues of pursuit. We talk directly to the drug companies, sometimes get compassionate drug. There's a variety of avenues we have such that it's a very rare circumstance where I want to give someone appropriate and standard of care therapy we're not able to. I, I hope that addresses your question. You. One more question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So the, the question is for, and, and I think that's a great question because I talked about PET scans earlier and, and using them effectively. If, well, if you're in, in Arkansas, you get PET scans every year. Um, to follow because it, it is more sensitive and it will detect changes in your myeloma sooner. The question is how clinically important is that if there's some slight changes in the PET scan but you feel well, your hemoglobin's well, your quality of life is good. And I guess in that setting PET scan to my knowledge has not made a difference there versus good clinical follow-up where you're seen every two to three months by your oncologist, blood tests, how are you feeling. And that that test right now, that's the critical one. If those are good, I'm not sure in most circumstances what a PET scan adds. A lot of, a lot of the instances PET scans may be done on that occasion in the setting of clinical trials and studies because there's no question there they're a little bit more sensitive to see changes in the disease. PET scans are not perfect and so one has to remember that subtle changes on a PET scan by no means suggest that your myeloma may be taking off. So I hope that answers your question. Last question then, and then I'm going to introduce the my, yeah. The question's diet and natural remedies. What, what I tell my patients is I, I don't prescribe, <coughs> sort of for, people are often disappointed because I don't have a lot to say about what you should eat other than use some common sense and make sure once in a while you eat something you like. That, that, that said, 
I want to be clear. That said, um, appropriate nutrition is important. We often get a dietitian involved. A lot, I would say 50 to 60 to 70 percent of patients that I manage use some form of natural therapies, either on their own with their family doctor or they see a naturopath. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at that more in a favorable light now. We're not sure, you know, where the benefits are. There may indeed be some. They're being looked at more critically in trials. And so uh, most of us have no problem with it. We just some, like you to tell us what you're on <coughs> to make sure it doesn't interact with some of the drugs that you're taking. For example, some people get high dose vitamin C intravenously. That's an issue if you're getting cytotox or chemotherapy in terms of it may affect some enzyme systems. So there's a few things like that where I'll say, wait a second. But for the vast majority of natural um, uh, agents that people look, go to, not a problem. Yeah, I'm just going to have the myeloma and lymphoma societies just say a couple words because we've got an engaged group um, about their organizations. Do you, do you want to start and introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Marcia McQuinney. Um, I'm representing uh, Myeloma Canada today. I, um, I'm really I'm with the Toronto Myeloma Support Group. So um, Myeloma Canada is the only specific to myeloma foundation in, in the country. They do an awful lot of advocacy for new drugs, the quality across the country, and uh, they have some um, information as well. Uh, if you have their, if you haven't had myeloma and you don't have their handbook, you you. You, that's that's really the guidebook for all patients. So help yourself out there, and um, they um, are doing fundraising now with 5K walks. So I would ask that you sign up to uh, receive emails and mailings from Myeloma Canada, and you'll get all that information. Uh, the Myeloma Toronto Support Group, uh, Toronto District. Group, has been meeting um, since um, 96, I think. And a support group, as you're all here, you know how important it is. We're, um, uh, the group is, is very congenial, and uh, we, we try to have speakers. We meet every two months. We try and have speakers, but sometimes we don't, and people like that as well, just talking amongst ourselves, what's your treatment, what's that treatment. The meetings are at uh, Dunn Valley and um, Lawrence area. And we have a website, myelomatoronto dot something. <laughs> and um, so the next meeting is April 14th. Dr. Roger Tiedemann, uh, who has uh, recently joined Princess Margaret from Mayo Clinic, will be talking on what's new. Actually, we asked him to talk about the uh, ASH convention where all the hematologists bring up all the what, what's new. Uh, so that's all, uh, April 14th. And um, I myself am the director of another group, Canadian Amyloidosis Support Group. Amyloidosis is not a cancer, but I imagine you're treat, you treat it in your yep. department. It's a, it's a plasma cell due to disease. Uh, it's very rare. It's more the one in a million than one in 200,000. So, uh, I just bring it up because if uh, you happen to know of anybody, um, please say I've heard of that and pass them on to a hematologist. It, it, it affects so many organs and uh, very hard to diagnose, so um, it, it's very helpful for people in, to have support in that group. Um, well, I guess that's it. Any questions about Marlo Canada that I can ask? Okay. And you've got some and you've got some information outside, right? My name is Sue Robson, and I'm executive director of Lymphoma Foundation Canada. And before I go any further, I just wanted to ask how many <coughs> patients or people are here because of their interest or affliction, unfortunately, with myeloma? Myeloma or lymphoma? Myeloma. 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 Okay. And the rest of you then are lymphoma. Is that correct? Okay. Just the only reason for my question was more curiosity, uh, because I know there is a huge mix of both. And before I get going, I just wanted to say something. It is no coincidence that you are able to be in York Region, I'm a resident of York Region and have been for many, many years, to be able to have your care closer to home. 
there may be bricks and mortar, and you may have a cancer center, but to have people the likes of Peter Anglin that are here, who have the experience that they have, and that are considered key opinion leaders in the world of hematolog hematological cancer, I think is really something that needs to be mentioned. And we're very lucky, because otherwise you'd be trekking down to PMH or Sunnybrook every single time, and we know how difficult that is. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.